So colleagues, if I can say welcome to those in the room, and this is wonderful. It's wonderful to see such a good turnout um, in, in real person, uh, mm -hmm. in real life, because uh, we've had a, quite the inverse um, for a whole season, and we are now beginning to have uh, the, um, the, the uh, online attendance being outnumbered by the in-person attendance. So that is a fantastic thing. And I'm very, very pleased to see everybody. Um, and there will be lunch after this for those who are staying as well. So um, if I can let everyone know we are now online and if I can welcome those who are online um, with us today as well and invite you to be very much part of this. And it's my great pleasure to um, be uh, welcoming uh, Lindsay Alberson who is an IAS residential fellow and also will then be a Fulbright fellow. And Steve Rice, who is here today, will do the introduction to Lindsay more specifically. But one of the things I want to say is that we have had a wonderful track record with Fulbright Fellows over, the, over a number of years now um, and, and have the wonderful news that, that, that we will be having toasting two next year as well and, and so forth. So this is a wonderful and long-term type of relationship that we have had and forged through the IAS and schools and the university. And we are really thrilled to be welcoming yet another really exciting, exciting Fulbright scholar who is going mm -hmm. to be with us for a, a longer period of time, which is also a nice thing for the IAS. So we are hoping not only um, to be uh, listening to your paper today, um, but also finding out how this unfolds over the next couple of months. And that'll be part of the sort of dialogue. So if people are tuning in today, Lindsay will be with us at the university for another few months. So please, please uh, feel free to be in touch with her um, and, and um, join in to other conversations conversations as they start to unfold. And Steve, if I can invite you please to invite, uh, to uh, welcome Lindsay more specifically, that would be really great. Yeah, my pleasure too. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Um, so first of all, my apologies to you, Marsha and Lindsay and others for not being there, but um, something meant that I couldn't arrive. I, I presume somebody will enjoy eating my lunch instead. So that's all good news. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lindsay, it's a great honour and a, and a great privilege, and I'm very excited that you're here. Um, the boring stuff, for those of you that don't know, Lindsay is Associate Professor at Montana State University in Bozeman. Uh, she did an undergraduate degree at Brown, which is interesting. The only, other, the only other people I know from Brown are all hardcore social scientists, so that's, that's one we should talk about at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, Lindsay went to a terrible, difficult, awful place to live, to do a PhD at uh, UC Santa Barbara. I've been there mm -hmm. once for a wedding and I could happily live there for the rest of my life. I think it's a beautiful <laughs> place to, to be. And then she went to Pennsylvania to the Stroud Water Center, um, which is surrounded. I just had a quick look on a map and it's surrounded by places called things like Newark, Nottingham, New London, Chester, <laughs> Reading, <laughs> Oxford. So um, I guess that part of Pennsylvania has pretty uh, deep uh, uh, British roots, but it's um, it's maybe some familiar names for Lindsay to arrive in, in Luga Baruga as well. Um, <laughs> we first became aware of Lindsay's work when Matt Johnson, so, who some of you know and may well be in the room or on the call, uh, was doing some really exciting master's work that I was fascinated by on the interactions between small stream insects and sediment transport. So it was uh, some ideas that I'd been aware of coming out of a lab in France, um, uh, Statzner's lab, but you know I wasn't aware of anyone else doing this kind of work. But we discovered Lindsay through this, and you know it was, you have those heart-stopping moments, don't you, when you're working on a project and then you discover the title of a paper and you think, shit, somebody else is already <laughs> doing it. But you know, nevertheless, that that relationship blossomed. I, I met Lindsay for the first time in person, I think. I was trying to remember, I think it was a SFS or a NABS meeting, and I think it was in Milwaukee. I have mm -hmm. vague memories, uh, but it was Milwaukee, I think, where there was the only other thing I know about Milwaukee is Laverne and Shirley came from there. That's a that's a cultural reference for the over 50s in the room. Um, and uh, and then things developed. Lindsay came to visit us. Uh, Catherine Sanders, who was doing a PhD with us a few years ago, went um, out to, to Lindsay's lab and did a great piece of work, which we're currently is on the verge of being published. It's in final revisions at Biological Invasions. And then this opportunity came up and we jumped on it. And, um, you know, Lindsay's work is right on the interface of, uh, of freshwater ecology and geomorphology. We approach it much from a geomorphological perspective. I'm interested in how much sediment ends up in the North Sea Basin as a function of biological energy 
and Lindsay has a more ecosystem engineering perspective on it. And together, I think we've got interesting things to do. Um, so with Paul and Kate, we're contriving some experiments at the moment. And, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to those, Lindsay, and, and to the talk. So I think that's more than enough from me. And um, I'll hand over to you. And, and again, warm wishes. And I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Steve, for that good introduction. And thank you, um, Marcia and Karen, too, for organizing this talk here today and for everybody who's here in person and folks who are online, too. Um, thank you for being here. I'm excited to tell you about some of my research. Whoops, I can do this. So before I start, I want to acknowledge and thank the many co-authors who have been part of the work I'll present today. Um, most of them are listed here. I also have new collaborators here at Loughborough who I'm really excited to get to work with. Um, and of course, there are many others who have helped make this work possible, um, technicians, undergraduates, and so on, who are not listed here. So I'm really grateful to that help. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, I have funding support to be here from the IAS and from Fulbright, so I'm really grateful uh, for that. And funding for the research itself has come from a variety of sources, including the National Science Foundation, UC Santa Barbara, Montana State University, which is my current home institution, and the Stroudwater Research Center in the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. <clears throat> All right, so a long history of research in ecology has focused on the role of large scale physical disturbances in controlling which species are present in a certain location, what their abundances might be like, um, and even things like what their reproductive strategies might be like. Classic examples include tsunamis that might decimate coral reefs or volcanoes that might decimate hillsides and others like forest fires and floods. Over the past several decades, we've begun to complement that sort of historical viewpoint that the physics is driving the biology with new paradigms that suggest that the organisms themselves might be regulating what the ecosystem looks like. And these have resulted in um, disciplinary, new disciplines like uh, biophysical coupling and ecosystem engineering, which really emphasize that the things that are alive are actually controlling the physical environment. So classic examples that you all might recognize are beavers, which build dams, that turn free flowing rivers into still ponds or termites that turn flat savannas into these landscapes riddled with these large physical structures that are fundamentally changing things like what the soil moisture content is like and what the nutrient content is like. And the idea that biology can modify its environment is not a new one. There is actually amazing work on this dating back a very long time. So Darwin actually has a book about how earthworms create what he called vegetable mold, we might call it compost or nutrient-rich soil. Wildebeest migrating can kick up kilotons of sediment and regulate whole annual sediment budgets. Tamarisk, an invasive plant in the southwest of the U.S., can fundamentally change uh, what river shape looks like. And this is one of my favorite examples. Jellyfish and other planktonic animals in the ocean have been sh shown to stir the ocean to a magnitude similar to wind and tide forcing. And the reality is um, that these two ideas that the physics are driving the biology and the biology is driving the physics are likely happening at the same time and even feeding back to one another, which has resulted in these cross-disciplinary um, research approaches that have really taken off in the last few decades called ecogeomorphology or ecohydrology, which seek to combine ecology with geomorphology or hydrology. So these are the topics we're interested in in my research lab. And we specifically think about this topic um, in freshwater ecosystems to ask questions about how physical conditions related to things like flow velocity or erosion are influencing who's there and how many of them are there, but also how that biology is feeding back to influence the physical conditions. Mm -hmm. One way to link the way that ecosystem engineering animals are influencing their physical environment to that feedback loop, so how ecosystem engineering animals are influencing physical conditions and then how those physical conditions feed back to influence who's there, is through some basic fundamental work in ecology, which is simply related to biotic interactions. So there are three general types of biotic interactions um, in nature. Two of these are negative, predation and competition. So in the example on the left here, that fish that's going to get eaten by the bear is going to suffer a negative consequence. It's going to die. Okay, <laughs> We know that's going to happen. 
The third type of interaction is actually a positive one, and this will not be the first reference to Spider-Man. I'm just warning you. The third type of, intera of interaction is a positive one. Um, it's often called facilitation, and it's when at least one of the two participants in that interaction actually benefits from that interaction. Sometimes both can benefit, which you all might know as a mutualism. Um, compared to negative interactions, positive interactions are really less well studied, um, but they're really amazing out there in nature. So I'll just give you a couple examples of how these things work. So this first one is from terrestrial environments. These are high alpine cushion plants. And without the presence of these cushion plants, which host a bunch of other little plants that live inside them, biodiversity in this landscape would be really low. So the presence of this facilitator ecosystem engineer changing this really harsh environment um, that's pretty cold, high elevation, poor soil conditions. The plants that live inside that cushion plant could not be there if it wasn't for the facilitative effects of this host. Another example that you might recognize is a coral reef. So corals build these physical structures that fundamentally change or create what the habitat is. And this is done by the animals, by the corals themselves. So these corals are creating habitat that might facilitate other species such as fishes. The way that facilitation can work is multifaceted. So I've mentioned a few ways that it happens. They can uh, change the physical environment. We know that ecosystem engineers can also change food resources and make food resources that are needed much more easily available. They can also provide transport and they can provide predator refuge. So these fishes, for example, might be able to hide inside that coral and get away from their predators. <clears throat> Compared to terrestrial examples, like with the cushion plants and marine examples with the corals, freshwater positive interactions are far less studied. So we've really only begun to scratch the surface of what we know about positive interactions stemming from ecosystem engineering animals in freshwater. And I think this is becoming increasingly important because we know freshwater is susceptible to a variety of different um, global changes, including flow extremes. So those could be really high flows. It could be really low flows like droughts, um, temperature extremes, and even things like excess nutrients that result in eutrophication. So we know these ecosystem engineering animals are important, um, and we know they change the physical environment. And so I think it's becoming important as well to consider how the loss of ecosystem engineers and what many agree is a sixth mass extinction happening now across the globe will impact what the environment looks like. So this is just one graphic that represents the fact that we know biodiversity is threatened across the globe. In this graphic, groups of threatened species are shown in groups of 100 in red for birds, mammals, and amphibians. And there's good evidence that freshwater species are at even higher risk than their marine or terrestrial counterparts. So if we're losing biodiversity, we might be underestimating the cost of biodiversity loss if the species that we're losing are ecosystem engineers that support others. And that's what we're interested in in my lab. So today I'm going to talk about three areas of research. I'll walk through some general patterns of freshwater positive interactions. And this is really an effort to simply describe what we know because this uh, topic is really in its infancy, I would say. And then I'll talk through some of the work we do with two particular model organisms that are ecosystem engineers um, and invertebrates, net spinning caddisflies and crayfish. And I'm here in the UK to work on crayfish. All right, so as I mentioned, um, freshwater positive interactions are pretty well understudied and we don't know a whole lot about them. And so this first part of the talk, I wanna just describe what we do know. And to do that, we've used a meta-analysis to summarize the literature, to distill some general patterns of who's important in positive interactions, who's the facilitator, who's the beneficiary, and what is the strength of the benefit that those beneficiary species get. So we compiled data from the literature using Web of Science search, which is really standard. That kicked back about 3,000 papers, which we read through, and whittled that down to 106 papers that had 340 studies that we could extract data from. So it's a pretty large data set that covers over 100 different papers. Um, as with all meta-analyses, there are standard rules for what data can be included. I don't have time to go through all of those right now, um, but I will tell you the most important ones. So a study must have reported the effect of a facilitator 
on its beneficiary for a treatment with the facilitator present, a control without that facilitator present, an estimate of sample size, and an estimate of variance about the mean. So that's pretty standard for meta-analyses. So in the example I have up here, um, let's say the beaver that's building a dam and changing the environment is the facilitator. Um, we are looking at the effect, the positive potential effects of beaver facilitators, which we classified as mammals, on beneficiaries, which might be frogs, which we classified as amphibians. And the paper must have reported the effect of the beaver on the frogs for treatment with the beaver present, a treatment without, an estimate of the sample size, and an estimate of the variance about the mean. And that allows us to calculate a really common response variable for meta-analyses, a log response ratio. So I have that abbreviated here as LRR, which is just the natural log of the ratio of the beneficiary response in the treatment compared to the beneficiary response in the control. So once all the data were collected, um, we had studies from across the globe. So the number of studies per location or region is shown here in progressively darker blue. <clears throat> and the exact study locations are shown in orange. I will note that we had no studies from Africa, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, or Siberia. When we looked at the studies, though, they were distributed pretty well. Um, there were certain locations where positive interactions in freshwater are well studied, so the U.S., for example. Um, and we also noticed that some facilitators were commonly studied in certain areas, and those are highlighted here in brown. So beavers, as facilitators, were commonly studied in Canada and Europe, and invasive beaver mussels were commonly studied in the U.S. All right, so we looked at who these facilitators were and who these beneficiaries were. And the first result here is shown by different taxonomic group on the y-axis. So we divided who the beneficiaries and the, who the facilitators were into groups we thought would be or could be important to distinguish. So those are shown on the y-axis here. And the first point I'll make is that there are actually a lot of different species or taxa that participate in freshwater positive interactions. This was a little bit surprising to us, but kind of exciting. Um, I will point out here that the number of studies per group, so number of studies is on the x-axis, so that's showing us the number of studies per group on the y-axis. Facilitators are in light blue and beneficiaries are in dark blue. So there are a lot of um, participants in positive interactions in freshwater. The second point is that mollusks are by far the most commonly studied facilitators, way above everything else. The second point is that other invertebrates in freshwater, so these are things like aquatic insects, are really commonly studied as the beneficiaries. The top three groups there, mollusks, plants, and other invertebrates are really well commonly studied compared to everything else. I'll also point out here um, that most groups were beneficiaries sometimes and facilitators sometimes. So that's shown by the fact that there tends to be a light blue and a dark blue point for all groups, which is pretty interesting. Um, one exception is mammals. They were only ever studied as the facilitator in our data set. <laughs> Okay, so that's the general description of who's sort of participating and what the, num what the distribution of the numbers of studies by group look like. Just as a couple examples here, um, I mentioned invasive zebra mussels. So those are common habitat. They kind of create these little reefs and habitats that other invertebrates like to use. So mayflies are commonly associated with those mussels. Redfin shiners do something that's really interesting. They lay their eggs in the nests of other fish species, and that can actually benefit the other fish species by reducing predation on those original fish species eggs. So that's a positive effect on that original fish species. And then the foothill yellow, uh, mountain yellow-legged frog will actually benefit Clodophora by moving around and grazing down fouling epiphytes. So those are just a couple examples of the types of facilitative interactions that we saw. Okay, I mentioned that we used a log response ratio to quantify the magnitude of the positive effect. So now log response ratio is on the x-axis, and those same groups are on the y-axis here. Facilitator identity is the top panel, and the beneficiary identity is the bottom panel. So because this is a ratio or a log response ratio, a value of zero here 
um, symbol the you guys can hopefully see the symbol there um, would indicate that the presence of the facilitator did not change the beneficiary response above the control. So that would indicate there's no positive effect. In contrast, I've now added a point there for crustaceans, for example, as the facilitators. If these points are falling to the right-hand side of that zero line, that indicates that there's a positive effect of the facilitator. So that's what we're interested in seeing. How far to the right of that red line are things falling? And here's what we find. <clears throat> so there are a couple points I want to make here. Let's look at the top panel first. So we detected no statistically significant difference in facilitator strength, depending on who the facilitator was. Or to say that another way, all facilitators had statistically similar positive effects on their beneficiaries. On average, facilitators increased their beneficiaries by 81%. So that indicates to us that freshwater positive interactions are indeed substantial. On the other hand, beneficiary identity was statistically significant. So we did see some statistically significant differences here. And I'll just point out a few things. Um, amphibians had the largest magnitude positive effect when they were the beneficiaries. But the only statistical difference here is actually between other invertebrates and mollusks. So when mollusks were the beneficiaries, they benefited more from the presence of a facilitator than other invertebrates um, like aquatic insects did. The final point I wanna make here is just to sort of re-emphasize that a lot of these beneficiaries here, so like fishes, um, amphibians, we know these groups are threatened by global change. So we know they're sensitive to things like damming or disease or excess nutrients. And we also now know that they're dependent on these facilitative effects coming from ecosystem engineers. And so if we lose those ecosystem engineering effects, there's potential that that will have cascading influences um, on the ability of the system to support these sensitive species. Okay, we were interested in whether the type of response measured by researchers would matter. So we classified what the response variable of the beneficiary was. So sometimes people might look at, for example, the effect of beaver facilitators on frogs and what they might measure it could be density of the frogs, it could be biomass of the frogs, it could be their reproductive output or something like that. So we um, quantified a bunch of different response variables here. And what we found is that there was actually a significant difference in how big the positive effect could be depending on response. And I'm just going to focus on, there are a lot of stories we could tell here. I'm just going to focus on the top three. So density and biomass responses were significantly stronger than diversity responses. And there are a couple of reasons why that could be. Um, it could be that positive interactions are happening in a pairwise fashion. So there's one facilitator that's changing the environment in a way that benefits one particular species. That could be happening in nature. It could also be that we researchers just tend to set our studies up to look at something like that. So we monitor you know, one facilitator's effect on one particular beneficiary. That could also be what's happening. And the third option here, I think, is that we just don't necessarily have great ways to measure diversity responses yet, or we're not looking for them in the right way. I think that could be an option as well. Either way, when density and biomass are measured as the response, they show significantly stronger positive effects than diversity responses do. <clears throat> because there's a lot of literature now out there indicating that invasion status is also a really important factor in understanding how nature is working, we classified the facilitator's invasion status um, for this paper as well. So this graph is showing native species, native facilitators here, and invasive facilitators here. And the log response ratio is that same x-axis. And what we found was a little bit surprising to us. Um, we found that invasive facilitators actually have stronger positive effects on their beneficiaries than native facilitators do. This is really interesting. And there are lots of reasons why this could be the case. So there's good evidence that invasive species simply have traits or even novel traits that allow them to do really crazy things in the environment. So it might be that they simply reach really high densities, or it might be that they introduce novel traits that are important for changing the system. It could also be, and there's good evidence now in the literature, that 
Invasions tend to occur in systems that are already degraded. So maybe they're already experiencing, you know, excess fine sediment or eutrophication or warming. And so the presence of that invasive facilitator might simply be improving conditions in areas that are already not doing all that well. Okay, so to summarize this part of the talk, we found out that ecosystem engineers are actually positively benefiting um, species in, in nature. So ecosystem engineers increase their beneficiaries by on average 81%. Density and biomass responded more positively than diversity did. We know that invasive facilitators have stronger positive effects, at least for this data set, than native facilitators did. And we also found that invertebrates, so things like aquatic insects or mollusks um, or crustaceans, are a big part of the story. They have large facilitative effects when they're the facilitators, but they're also really commonly studied as the beneficiaries too. So that brings me to the next part of the talk. We know uh, invertebrates as ecosystem engineers are really important. Hopefully I just showed you some data to convince you of that. We also know that invertebrates are really threatened. So this is a figure from a paper from 2010 that shows the proportion of taxa that were surveyed that were either considered secure in white or some level of threatened in shaded gray. And I've highlighted the invertebrates here. So freshwater insects and crayfish and mussels in yellow. And the main point here for me is that Aquatic invertebrates are as threatened, if not more so, than birds and mammals, and perhaps even freshwater fishes. Simply to emphasize again that we know invertebrates are important ecosystem engineers, and we know they're threatened by a whole host of factors related to global change and human activities. And so it might be important to understand what the roles of these invertebrate ecosystem engineers are in the environment, especially if we're going to start to lose them. So that's what we study in my lab. And I wanna talk about two of the model organisms that we use to ask questions about how biology is controlling physical conditions in freshwater ecosystems. So I'll first talk about net spinning caddisflies and then I'll transition to crayfish. Okay, net spinning caddisflies. Um, if you have not seen these before, I'm gonna walk through their natural history and tell you about some of their ecology. Um, these are very cool aquatic insects. They're relatively small, so you can see the scale bar there on the left-hand side, 10 millimeters or about a centimeter in length. Um, these are in the family Hydrocycidae, and they're larvae in the water for most of their life. So they live underwater in rivers, so they tend to live in flowing habitats like rivers or streams for 10 to 12 months. When they're ready, they crawl to the side of the river. Um, after they've grown their wings, they emerge onto land. The males and the females find each other and mate, and the female will lay her eggs back in the water and the cycle will start again. Those adults will die after they mate that first time. So their whole life cycle is just about a year long and they're in the water for the majority of that time. When they're in the water, they're filter feeders, and they spin these incredible underwater structures that we call um, silk nets or silk retreats. So in the middle image there, I've got a picture of a silk web, a caddisfly silk web that's taken under a microscope, and I have not done anything to that. So that's how they actually make their silk webbing. So they place each one of these silk threads into just the right spot, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, so it's really similar to like what a spider is doing in the air. So they're putting that web up to catch food particles that are floating downstream. And the food that they're eating is things like leaf parts or twig parts or sometimes animal parts, sort of whatever is up in the water column that can get caught on that net. They'll then pick that food off of the net. So the silk webbing is amazing. Um, they tend to build these silk webs in the pore spaces of rocks. And I'll show you a video of this here in a second. Um, so here's a whole bunch of silk, for example, on a couple of rocks that we've picked up. And this will become important in, a little bit later when I talk about sediment erosion and binding together gravels as well. So the silk is right here. And then here's the little caddisfly larva. Okay, so this is a video. It's going to cycle through. We worked with a filmmaker to get these, I think, pretty impressive and awesome underwater shots of what caddisflies are doing. And I'll just tell you a little bit more about their life history here. Um, in case anyone's wondering, the fuzzy stuff on their stomach, that's their gills. That's how they get their, their oxygen. 
And you can see that caddisfly is like building its web. It's using its mouth parts to like place each one of these threads so it, it can potentially maximize food uh, capture. I'll also point out here that these the webbing is in the pore spaces of the rocks and it's sort of bridging those two rocks together, which, as I mentioned, will become important later. So net spinning caddisflies are really diverse. There can be as many as five species or so living in the same stream at the same time. And even though they're small, they can reach really high densities. So there can be thousands per square meter. So that's like a thousand of these little structures and something the size of your desk. So even though they're small, they reach really high densities, and they're also incredibly diverse. And we're interested in how these silk structures um, will influence flow velocity and erosion regimes, change that physical environment. And we know that flow velocity and erosion regimes are like the critical physical conditions of streams that will influence everything else that's going on in a riverbed. So in this first effort here, um, we were looking at the role of caddisflies in influencing flow velocity, which is difficult, although doable to do um, with actual experiments, but also can be done using modeling. So I'm just going to show you the results of this computational fluid dynamics model. So in this model, uh, we simulated a gravel bed. The average gravel size here is 40 millimeters, a little bit smaller than, like, say, the size of your fist. And we can add in caddisfly structures to this model. I mentioned that the, the nets or the webs are like amazing structures. They're really complicated, which turns out to be difficult to model. <laughs> so, you know, we tried. And so uh, it didn't work. And we ended up estimating what a caddisfly structure is as a solid sheet. You know, it's a pretty good approximation. And then we spread these sheets out in a simulated gravel bed in an arrangement that mimics what it would look like in nature and a similar orientation to what a real web would look like. And we're interested in whether you put these sheets in the pore spaces and they actually do slow down flow. So I'm gonna show you a GIF of the model results for three scenarios where we had a control with no structures, caddisfly structures present, 330 per square meter or 735 per square meter. And I'll remind you again that these are pretty reasonable densities. So hundreds to thousands per square meter is common. Sometimes caddisflies can be in the 10,000 per square meter. So these are reasonable, maybe even on the low end. So this is just gonna cycle through the three scenarios and I've just converted the raw number of nets to meters number per square meter on the bottom. So control, medium density, high density. Flows moving from left to right here, and the response variable is magnitude of velocity in meters per second. Where slow velocities are indicated by cool colors and fast velocities are indicated by warmer colors. And what we're looking for here is more blue. So we can visualize this and we also can actually estimate it um, quantitatively, which I've shown you the percent reductions on the bottom here. But we're looking for areas of more blue as you increase than that. So I'll just point out a couple areas where that happens. Right here, there's a little spot around here. And then there's a little spot around here. Okay. So what we find is that the presence of these structures in the riverbed does in fact reduce near bed velocity. And that reduction is up to 60% when there's 735 of these per square meter. So caddisflies are certainly affecting flow conditions with their silk webs. Not only are they affecting flow, they're affecting erosion as well. So we look at the effect of this caddisfly silk sort of as a binding agent holding down the rocks in a couple of different ways. We've used modeling and experiments. I'll describe uh, a model here and then show you some data for an experiment. So this model is a Weibrig and Smith 1980, if anyone here is a sediment transport modeler, and it predicts the movement of one single grain. I mean, this is how detailed this is. One single grain shown here in red on a riverbed. And what it does is predict the movement of that one single grain using physical or abiotic forces. So things like lift or drag. We've modified that model to include the, the biotic forces of the caddisfly nets. And we do that in a way that allows us to account for how many of those silk nets are there, 
where they're distributed. So we can actually account for like where on the bottom of this grain that silk webbing is built in the pore space. And then the tensile strength of that silk material as well. And I think um, this is kind of important because we know caddisflies um, have really interesting patterns of where they use space, for example. So this is a picture looking down into a bucket with caddisflies that we had for a lab experiment that had been hanging out in the bucket for a little while. Each one of these is a little caddisfly with its silk web built over it. And you can see that they've spaced themselves out here like surprisingly regularly. And that's important. They do that to maximize food capture. So we can account for that spacing in our model and we can account for their tensile strength. So we actually measure the tensile strength of the silk material using a tensile meter. So you pull on the silk and we can do that for different species. So the net tensile strength in megapascals is shown here in this bottom graph for arctopsyche and hydropsyche, two net spinning caddisflies. They commonly coexist. They're common in like high elevation snowmelt fed streams in the US and the Rockies. Um, arctopsyche is about three times the size of hydropsyche and body size and it builds statistically significant stronger silk. So we know that the caddisflies space themselves out, that might be something that we need to account for looking at how they can hold rocks down. And we know their silks are different strengths depending on what the species are. So I mentioned we have a model that predicts that caddisflies do in fact hold rocks down, make it harder for those rocks to erode. We've also looked at this with experiments. So I'll just show you um, one example of an outcome that we did for a lab experiment where we have a control with no caddisflies present. So just a riverbed, just rocks. Hydropsyche present, that's that smaller species and arctopsyche present, that larger species. Critical shear stress in Pascal's is the response variable here. Essentially that's how hard it is to get the rocks to move. So if you have a lower value of critical shear stress, the bed is less stable, it's easier to erode. If you have a higher value of shear stress, it's more stable and you need more force to get those rocks to start to move. And here's what we find for the presence of caddisflies in an experimental setting. The presence of those silk webs increases critical shear stress by an average of 50%. And there are differences between the species that make some sense with what we know about their silk tensile strength. So arctopsyche, that bigger species that builds stronger silk, increases the force you need to get rocks to move more than hydropsyche does. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna pause here. I told you this was coming back. Um, this to me is pretty incredible, okay? So this is like a human making silk. That's crazy. And we think that's pretty impressive, right? We make movies about that. Same thing is happening here with caddisflies. They are making silk, which is pretty unbelievable. And they're doing it under the water. And that silk is holding down rocks that are many times that caddisfly's own weight. So that would be like an average sized human being able to hold down a van, you know, 25 to 50 times its own weight. To me, that's pretty incredible. I will also point out here how nerdy I am. I saw this van and it had a caddis one license plate, which I was like, oh my God, what's happening? I live in a place where there's a lot of fly fishing. So this makes sense, okay. <laughs> So this is pretty impressive to me um, and something that I think could potentially be pretty underappreciated for what's going on underneath the water that we don't really see with our naked eye, but the, that is likely happening because we know net spinning caddisflies are widespread across the globe. So if caddisflies are influencing flow and erosion, we think that should influence things that live in the riverbed because we know invertebrates, uh, fish eggs, biofilm, all of those things that are acting in the riverbed are influenced by flow and erosion. So we've started to investigate how caddisfly structures and their influence in the environment might be affecting other invertebrates. And that could be due to a variety of mechanisms. I've talked about two of these here. So changing flow regimes, changing erosion regimes, it could be food supplementation. So you can see like this caddisfly structure has a lot of leaves and twigs in it. So it could be that that structure is providing food or a place for prey to hide from their predators. <clears throat> Either way, we're simply interested in documenting like, is there, is it possible that there are other invertebrates associated, positively associated with these structures? 
So we've um, been studying this in a watershed in Colorado, which is sort of smack dab in the middle of the US along a pretty big elevation gradient from 2000 meters up to about 3000 meters. So 10,000 feet at the highest elevation. So these are pretty high elevation sites. We grab the silk, put it in a vial with ethanol so we can preserve whatever is on that silk material at the time that we grab it. And then we can ID what's there um, back in the lab. And we are finding some pretty interesting results, I think. So the number of individuals per net is on the y-axis here for eight different orders of invertebrates on the x-axis. And the first thing I'll point out here before I even show you any data is that we had eight different orders of invertebrates living inside these silk structures, which I think is pretty amazing. On average, um, we found 20 individuals of other invertebrates per net. So 20 other invertebrates are using these structures when we grab them, we find them associated with the structures. Dipterins or midges, were by far the most common thing. So they're shown here. Um, we found up to 78 individual midges in a single net. Uh, that was the max value, which is really, really high. But on ev average, it was 20 total individuals per net. So lots of midges. Um, but we were also surprised to see there were other net spinning caddisflies, stoneflies, and even mayflies. So lots of different groups using these structures, potentially making use of that low flow habitat or more stable habitat. All right, so to summarize this part of the talk, we know that caddisfly nets reduce flow. We know they increase sediment stability or reduce erosion. We know that different caddisfly species that have different neck architectures and that space themselves out have different effects on the physical environment. Other benthic organisms are positively associated with these structures. And we're continuing to work on when and where and like what the strength of this positive effect might be for other inversions. Okay, let's talk a little bit about crayfish here. So along with that spinning caddisflies, we've been interested in the activity of crayfish in riverbeds. And they're modifying the riverbed too. So really similar to what caddisflies are doing, they're changing what the riverbed looks like. Crayfish are doing that too, in a bit of a different way. So this video is showing a crayfish that's native to the US. This is a lab experiment. Um, it's a spiny cheek crayfish. This is sped up, okay? They don't actually move that fast. Um, but they are really active. Like you can see this, this crayfish is just like doing its thing, moving rocks around, using its claws to move rocks. I'll point out some of these rocks are really large, like many times that crayfish's own weight. It's making itself like a little divot to hang out. Um, and it can change bed topography by doing that. It can also expose subsurface gravel. So in this experiment, the subsurface underneath that first layer of rocks was colored pink. It's just aquarium gravel so that we could visualize what proportion of the bed the crayfish had moved around. And we'll come back to that here in a second. So crayfish are really active, changing what a riverbed looks like. So we've been interested in how we quantify that and what things might be important to consider. So I'll just show you a little bit of data here from, from some past studies. This one was looking at how body size of the crayfish might matter for how much work it does in the gravel bed. We had two sides of the crayfish. Uh, I know this is blurry, but hopefully you can see the modeling there. So there's uh, the small crayfish, young of the year, really tiny, their claws, I mean, you can't even see them. So like that's a claw right there. Um, really small claws. And we also had older crayfish, maybe two to three years old, larger in size. And we were looking at the effects of these crayfish on the riverbed. So there are two responses here. The one on the left is the grain diameter moved on average in centimeters. So how big of rocks were they moving? The one on the right is the proportion of the bed with the subsurface exposed, which is essentially a proxy for how much work they did. There are three treatments, the large crayfish, the small crayfish, and then a control with no crayfish present. And there's water moving in these experiments. So we have to have a control just to document whether the water itself is moving rocks or not. So what we find is that small and large crayfish are moving rocks of similar size. The different letters there indicate significant differences. So if there are two A's, those are the same. If there's an A and a B, those are statistically different. So small crayfish are capable of moving rocks that are huge compared to how big those little claws are, um, but they don't actually do it that often. So they're capable of moving big rocks 
but they don't do as much work as big, uh, big crayfish. So this is the proportion of the bed that had the surface moved away and the subsurface exposed. Large crayfish moved more of the bed than small crayfish or the control. So small crayfish are capable of moving rocks, they just don't do it that often. I showed you an example where we had two coexisting ecosystem engineers. So those two caddis flies together. We're also interested in what happens when you have an invasive engineer replace a native engineer. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about here is invasive crayfish. Crayfish are one of the most widespread global invaders. They've been spread pretty much everywhere. And there's good evidence that they outcompete native crayfish. They change biodiversity. They change nutrient cycling and productivity. And there's really neat evidence from the UK and Europe showing that they can regulate sediment dynamics. So some of this work has come out of Loughborough even. So they've moved, uh, invasive crayfish can move gravels, create pit and mound structures, so change the topography of the bed. They can loosen the gravels and change erosion, and they can increase turbidity. So there is good evidence that crayfish invas invasions in the UK and Europe are having these types of effects. And we were interested in how that might be playing out in the US. So we've looked at how rusty crayfish, which are invasive in parts of the US, influence the bed. Rusties are pretty large. So you guys can notice maybe here, they're big claws up to six inches or so in length, identifiable by this rust colored spot on the back of their carapace. They're native to the Ohio River Basin, but they've been moved throughout the Midwest, throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region, um, probably by fishermen using them for bait. As I mentioned, there is good evidence that invasive crayfish do tend to be um, bigger and have higher population densities, which allows them to outcompete natives. They tend to be better predators than natives, and they tend to be less nutritious for fish that are eating them. We are interested in whether they also might be moving sediments around. So this is an in situ experiment in Pennsylvania where we had cages in a stream and those cages either had crayfish present, rusty crayfish, which are invasive in Pennsylvania, or they didn't. It was just a control with rocks present. And we measured a bunch of different features of the gravel bed and other invertebrates response. And I'm just gonna show you one of these responses that I think is pretty striking. So we set this crayfish experiment up with clean gravels. So this is a picture of what the bed looked like in the controls and the crayfish cages on day one. They're both clean. That's how we set the experiment up. After two weeks, however, they looked really different. So the controls had a lot more fine sediment accumulating on the riverbed than the crayfish cages did. And this sort of makes sense. We know crayfish are moving around in that riverbed. They're moving those gravels over. And what that does is suspend all that fine sediment up into the water column and move it downstream. So we saw really strong effects of rusty crayfish on benthic fine sediment accumulation. We measured what other invertebrates responded in terms of density. So density of other invertebrates in number per square meters on the y-axis here for the control cages with no crayfish and the crayfish cages on the far right. And what we found surprised us a little bit. So we found that other invertebrates were actually more dense in cages that had crayfish present. And this was surprising because we know crayfish prey on other invertebrates, but might make sense if benthic fine sediment is what's controlling abundance of invertebrates in this system. So I'll just remind you here that those control cages were covered in fine sediment by the end of two weeks. And we know that excess fine sediment like that isn't great for a lot of invertebrates. So that clogs the pore spaces so they can't access that habitat. Um, it might prevent the growth of their food, like algae. Um, and we know that fine sediment also can be detrimental and clog their gills. So that's a detriment potentially to um, other invertebrates that might reduce their abundances in treatments where there's no crayfish. Okay, so to summarize this part of the talk, we know crayfish can alter the riverbed by moving gravels and suspending fine sediment. I'll emphasize again here that the traits of the engineer do appear to matter. So in the example I gave for crayfish, body size was important, but I do think this is important to point out here that 
adding biological realism, like the body size of the crayfish or the tensile strength of different species of caddisfly might help us improve how we think about these ecogeomorphic or eco-hydrology linkages. And then finally, reduced fine sediment on the bed might be positively influencing or improving conditions for invertebrates. And that brings me to what I'm here to do. So I'm here to continue thinking about how crayfish and specifically invasive crayfish are controlling what the riverbed looks like. Here in the UK, there's an invasive crayfish called the signal crayfish, pretty widespread, as you can see on that top um, map where accepted uh, documentation of the presence of signal crayfish has been found. So pretty widespread. Signals are pretty easy to identify based on that white colored patch on the hinge of their claws. So we'll be running experiments and thinking about how crayfish are changing what the riverbed looks like, how they're moving fine sediments in sand. If they're moving fine sediments in sand, thinking about where is it moving to? Is it being transported downstream or is it being moved into the bed? And then finally, if they are moving sand around in gravel bedded rivers, is it possible that they're cleaning up those gravels and perhaps providing patches that are more suitable or beneficial to other things that use the riverbed like other invertebrates and things like biofilms and microbes. Okay, I'm interested in improving the way that we think about how ecosystem engineers modify their environment. And we almost certainly know that ecosystem engineering activities are beneficial to many different species. At the same time, we know these engineers are susceptible to global change. So they might be on the decline, they might be competing with invasive species. Um, they might be suffering you know, from all these effects from a bunch of different global change parameters. <clears throat> At the same time, we know that global change is affecting environments. So we're seeing changes to land use. We're seeing changes to flow regimes. We're seeing changes to sediment loads. And the work I'll be doing here is thinking about how some types of human disturbances, like introductions of invasive engineers, interacts with other types of human disturbances like excess fine sediments. And I'll leave it there and hopefully I have some time for questions. Thanks for listening.